Hello everybody, it's Uncle John from Your Story Hour, and I'm here to bring you another chapter from Too Much Salt and Pepper by Sam Campbell. Let's get right back to it and see what's going on with Salt and Pepper and Sam and Ginny and Carol out at the sanctuary. Chapter 12 is entitled, Work, Work, Work. Industry and Intelligence. The fifth day of Carol's stay at the sanctuary started with a bang. There is no mere, that is no mere figure of speech. It was a bang that echoed and re-echoed about the silent, dark draped shores of the lake. The clock was counting off the first hours of a new day, and we were all sleeping peacefully when suddenly, at the very side of our cabin, there came a startling crash. Rapings, bumpings, and the noisy flight of an empty can down the hillside. The disturbance shook the forest out of its slum slumber, set the squirrels to chattering, and drew questioning twitters from sleepy robins, and brought a snort of alarm from a deer on the mainland. What's that? called Carol from her tent house. We echoed her question. Honk, 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 said an innocent-sounding voice somewhere overhead. There's your answer, I called to Carol, and then to the invisible porcupine. Salt, you imp, what in the world have you done now? He honked some sort of an explanation, and I dressed and went out to investigate. His tones were soft and a sort of saccharine sweet. He reminded me of a youngster who had spilled a jar of jam all over everything and then tried to avoid punishment like an infant angel. I heard him scratching his way down a tree trunk, and he fairly cooed his greeting as I walked up to him. "'Yes, Tom Sawyer,' I snapped. "'Mighty innocent, aren't you? You don't fool me with your sweetness. The only reason I won't give you a whipping is because I don't know how it could be done.' It wasn't difficult to see what had happened. A ladder had been left leaning at a sharp angle against this, this tree a few feet from the cabin. Salt with his fine neck of doing disturbing things, had chosen that particular tree for a nocturnal climb. Hundreds of trees around, but he had to pick that one. As he climbed upward, he no doubt had wedged himself under the ladder, forcing it outward until it tipped over. The ladder had crashed against a house, scraped and bumped, where it struck an empty kerosene can and sent it bouncing along on a noisy downhill journey. The first Gray streaks of dawn were spreading along the eastern horizon as I stood there scolding my porcupine. Ginny and Carol were laughing. The whole sanctuary seemed to be very much awake. Salt took my scolding as high praise. He came hustling down the tree and right up to my feet, wanting to play. While I continued telling him what I thought of any four-footed rascal that would break into our sleep and stir up the whole North Woods like that, he whirled about honking happily and acting all too cute. Before I knew it, we were all caught up in the energetic session of hide-and-seek. Soon, Carol had dressed and joined in the game. The two of us bewildered poor Salt by hiding in separate places and clapping our hands simultaneously. He did not know which way to go. Now Jenny had dressed and had come to watch the fun and to sympathize with Salt because of our unfairness. Salt was trying his best to play in accordance with the rules. We would have had our preliminary tussle as usual. Then he would stand still while I ran to hide. When I clapped my hands, he would start toward my hiding place. But then suddenly... Carol, hiding in an opposite direction, would clap her hands. Around, Salt would whirl and race or waddle toward her. Then I would clap my hands. Then Carol. Then I. Then Carol. Until Salt was dizzy from jerking his head around. Finally disgusted with such flagrant violations of the rules, he climbed a tree, grunting his opinion to us. While I dare say it was not too complimentary. Then the forest quieted down once more, and we three stood there looking at the quiet of the dawn, listening to the first bird songs. In the eastern sky, ribbon-like clouds were touched with pink. Little puffs of breezes were blowing about through the trees, which bent stiffly as if they were doing their morning exercises. The world is getting ready to go to work, 
Maybe we should get an early start. Today, we are going to study intelligence and industry as we find it in nature. What do you two say? The sleep is out of us now. Shall we get in our canoe and start searching? The three of us agreed that it was a good idea. At once, we were animated with plans and purpose. Janie would prepare a bite of breakfast, and I would get the canoe in the water. Let me get the canoe ready, pleaded Carol. I know how to do it. All right, Carol, I, I agreed, knowing the canoe was light enough for her to handle. I'll get some wood then. Each went about his chosen task, but it wasn't more than a few minutes until we heard a scream and a splash at the pier, and then laughter. Oh, she's done it again, cried Jenny with amused concern. I hurried to the scene of the commotion to find that our suspicions were true. Carol had done it again. She was just climbing out of the water onto the pier as I arrived. Obviously, she wasn't hurt. Good balsam juice. How did that happen, Carol? I exclaimed as I ran to help her. She was laughing so she could not reply at first. Finally, she managed to explain that after she had got the canoe into the water, she stepped into it only to find herself suddenly deposited into the lake. It was all so quick. She couldn't understand how it had happened. Well, I know what you did, I said with conviction. You must learn how to get in a canoe. There's a little trick to it. Are you too cold or do you want to learn right now? She wasn't cold, she said, and in fact, she enjoyed her morning dip. Well, it will, go, it will only take a minute. Now watch me, I said, pulling the canoe alongside the dock with a paddle. You cannot just step into a canoe, for the action of stepping pushes the light craft away. That is how you got into trouble. You walked into canoe, the canoe jumped away, and you know the rest from experience. Now observe closely. And in slow motion, I demonstrated the accepted way of getting into a canoe. First, you get the canoe closely alongside the pier, I explained, matching my words with actions. See that all paddles are out of the way so that you won't step on them or stumble over them. Then balance your weight on one foot, reach out with the other to the center of the canoe. Do not step, just reach out. Now note, when my foot touches the right spot in the center, I just shift my weight from the foot that is on shore to the one in the canoe. This prevents pushing the canoe away. When my weight is shifted the canoe, I lift my foot from the pier again without pushing, and see, I am safely in the canoe without even rocking it. I think I understand, said Carol, watching closely, her clothes dripping a pool of water. Would you do it once more, and then I'll try. All right, I said, beginning the repetition actions. Now notice, the canoe is alongside the pier. All paddles are out of the way. Now I balance on one foot while I reach out to the center of the canoe with the other. You see, I have not stepped into the canoe. My weight is still on the foot on the dock. That makes it impossible for me to push the canoe away or lose my balance. All of which sounded very logical and looked reasonable until the foot on which I was so safely balancing slipped in some water flowing from Carol's clothes and I went gliding into water waist deep. For a moment, Carol stood speechless. Seizing upon her silence, I tried to pretend this was all in the instruction. And you see what happens, Carol, if, you do not wa if I do not watch my footing, I said in a matter-of-fact tones. It would have been wiser for me to pick out a dry spot to stand on, and furthermore, but I got no further. Carol could not be deceived any longer. This feet-first dive of mine had not been intentional, and she knew it. She bubbled up, she doubled up with laughter, and her squeals brought an anxious inquiry from Jenny as to what was going on. We falsified that everything was all right, each one hesitating to tell on the other. I climbed out on the pier, sputtering something about our next lesson, including instructions on getting out of a lake. <laughs> Jenny had finished breakfast preparations. Morning light was growing and the best canoeing time slipping past. Out of the cabin door to call us and then stood gasping at what she saw. There, Carol and I stood side by side, our clothes soaked, our shoes gushing with water, our expression somewhat like the worn, that worn by salt in his innocent pretensions. Now, how in the world did this happen? asked Jenny. Oh, I said casually, I've been showing Carol the right way to get in a canoe. 
He's a fine, thorough teacher, said Carol in mock seriousness. And she's a most apt pupil, I commented. Jenny threw up her hands in helplessness. The sun was tipping the pine trees with red by the time we had changed to dry clothes, eaten our breakfast, and were ready to go. We got into the canoe while I received many a jibe about my mishap. We moved silently over the waters, gliding through banks of gray mist. In a tall birch tree along the island shore, Salt was busy eating leaves. We thanked him for awakening us to such an early... Such a world of lively beauty, but he never looked up from his eating. It felt to my paddle as if the canoe were coasting downhill that morning. So easily did it glide through the reflections and among the pillars of rising mists. Despite our hilarious moments before our departure, we sat in silence now. The canoe sang a little song as its bow gently ruffled the waters. Where to? asked Carol in a soft voice. Anywhere would have been all right. The world was sparkling with miracles, and we could not have a direction that did not lead to interest and adventure. But there was definite but there were definite plans in my mind. We go to the Bay of the Beavers, Carol, I said. For remember, we are to look for intelligence and industry in nature. Where better could we find that than in the life and work of the beaver? And we talked of the tremendous activity we looked upon in the natural world around us. And it was, to be sure, but active. Everything in the universe was moving, developing, growing, working ceaselessly at its evolution. Nature will not have it otherwise. Creation is based upon energy. Work is a law which cannot be broken. Never does anything stand still. Even while a clock ticks a single second, everything that exists has changed a little, moved a little, grown or developed a little. Plants have their plans to follow. Animals find in their instincts a demanding design for their lives. Rocks and rivers, lakes and lands are in ceaseless motion. Mountains are building up and wearing down. Continents rising and falling. Waters are forever rising in ev evaporation, raining upon the land and racing in rivers back to the sea. Every star in the heavens is on the move at staggering speed. The universe is set in motion, and in motion it must remain. That is why we all must learn to work, Carol, I said as we were nearing Beaver Bay. Laziness and idleness are against the grain of nature, and they bring no happiness. It is the busy individual who is in step with the universe. The lives of all successful men tell us that there is no real rest but action, no joy in life except in well-directed work. But our conversation was silenced as we noticed an animal swimming through the smooth surface of the water. We had now entered Beaver Bay. Paddling stopped and the canoe drifted on silently. The little swimmer who had caught our attention passed within a few yards of us. It was a beaver and he was towing along a freshly cut aspen limb about two feet long and four inches no doubt he was headed for the large beaver house that looked like a great pile of brush on the shore back of a protecting point of land. This house was being enlarged, strengthened, and prepared for winter. A small log, the small log the animal was taking in, would find its place among scores of others similar to it. As the beaver disappeared into the misty distance, we noted beneath us on the bottom of the lake a great cache of food his clan had gathered for the winter. It was a large pile of leafy brush cut from live trees and weighted to the bottom by stones and water-soaked logs. When the lake was frozen over, these animals would swim under the ice and feed upon the bark of the twigs and branches. We sculled in close to sh shore to see the work that was being done. A large number of trees had been cut. Most of them were aspens, though a few white birch, cherry, black ash, and maple trees had been taken too. Looking from this one point where our canoe touched the shore, we could count 25 trees that had been cut down by these energetic little workers. These trees had fallen in all directions of the compass. There is a story widely spread that beavers can drop a tree in any w direction they wish. If this is true, there are certainly many and varied. My observation 
to the conviction that not only do they let the chips fall where they may, but the trees as well. Certainly, in that little patch on Beaver Bay, there was no evidence of directional cutting. The trees before us were this way and that, lying uphill and down, across each other in a way that would be most inconvenient for the further work of the beavers. It seems reasonable that the little creatures would not want them that way if they could prevent it. Now we heard a gnawing sound not unlike salts crunching at our door sill. I turned the canoe in the direction of the sound, cautioning Jenny and Carol to be I pulled the canoe along, careful that my paddle did not create even a whispering whirlpool. We were dealing with a creature who is the touch-me-not of the forest. If a sound, a smell, a little motion caught his attention, he would be gone. The gnawing sound increased source. A bit of brush at the shore gave us some concealment. And there, a few feet back from the water, we saw a fine old beaver working earnestly at an aspen. The tree was fully eight inches in diameter, and he had cut it nearly halfway through before we arrived. The animal was so engrossed in what he was doing that he did not notice us. He was a good-sized beaver, weighing about 40 pounds. The ground about him was strewn with chips from the tree. Some of them were five, six, and seven inches in length. Now he was showing us just how his cutting was done. He stood upright on his hind feet, braced firmly by his flat tail, his front paws against the tree. With his chisel-like amber-colored teeth, he cut deeply in the wood, then quickly cut again, about five inches lower. Then he bit into the wood midway between the two cuts and pried out a big chip. This he dropped to the ground. Now he cut out another chip and yet another until he had chewed his way almost through the tree. Occasionally he would cease his labors a few feet and survey the tree as if determining just when it would fall. Then he would return to it. Chips would fly again. It seemed to us as we sat there watching this little drama of nature that we did so by special privilege. The forest had opened a secret door for us and we had tiptoed in, but we knew we were there on probation. One breach in good manners, one move that would break the prof and profane the silence, and our adventure would be closed. We were guests, spectators, and must behave as such. But the busy old beaver continued his work. The chips he was cutting out were not so large as heretofore. He was working more at the center of the wound he was making in the tree. Presently, the tree bent a little to one side. There was a crackling sound as the last bit of supporting fiber commenced to break. The beaver moved quickly, retreating a few feet for safety. He beat upon the ground with its fat, flat tail. This seems to be a warning to other beavers that a tree is to fall. It is their way of saying, Timber! The tree now came crashing to the ground. Strangely, the sound made not the slightest disturbance among the forest folk. There was no break in the bird's songs. There was no saucy chatter from the squirrel or snort from the deer. The old beaver himself made no move. This was a natural, expected sound. The wilderness had known such events through the ages. But our composure was at an end. Carol, carried away by what she had seen, turned about in her seat at the canoe bow to join her enthusiasm with ours. The canoe rocked until it dipped water. Carol, called Jenny in a voice that was not so subdued as it was intended to be. Carol, I called, striving to steady the craft, barely catching my paddle as it was slipping into the lake. Sorry, whispered the excited Carol, but her apology was not enough for the beaver world. We of our cabin, there came a sharp sound as if someone had struck the water with a flat board. Immediately it was repeated. It sounded like a muffled gunshot. Another beaver had been swimming silently, looking us over. When our moment of excitement came, he simply warned the forest there were intruders present. This warning is given by the beaver striking the tail water with the fl his flat tail while he makes a quick dive. It is a startling sound, and while it was, has a special message for the beaver people, all creatures of the woods will become alert and cautious. The beaver that had been doing the cutting lost no time in seeking safety in the lake. 
Soon, there were two of them swimming about, getting farther and farther from the scene, repeating their crash dives all the while. No need for us to be cautious now. The show was over. Those beavers would not return into the presence of such discourteous guests as if they had proved to be as we had proved to be besides the sun was now high in the morning sky and these little creatures preferred not to be about in daylight we laughed freely i presume jenny and carol did not know how near we had come to another swim that eventful morning when a canoe tilts far enough to dip up water it is all too close to going over but here we were right side up and dry so why worry? Since we could see the beavers no more, we landed their work, the freshly cut tree stump, on which the teeth marks of the beaver were plainly etched. This tree would now be cut up into convenient lengths of from two or th to three feet each. In nights to come, the cutting would be done, and at each place where a cut would there would be left on the ground a pile of chips. The smaller limbs would be used for food. Some of them, no doubt, would be taken to the food cache we had seen on the bottom of the lake. Larger pieces would be towed away and used in the construction of the house. We were amazed at the number of trees the beavers had cut. Scores of them lay along the shore. There must be a hundred beavers working here, exclaimed Jenny. Probably not more than six, I corrected, for the work even a single beaver can do is always difficult to comprehend. We walked along the shore to their house. It lay in a well-chosen spot near the water. The little workers had heaped it high with newly cut wood. As winter approached, they would plaster it with mud mixed with leaves and grass. This material in among the sticks and small logs would form a sort of reinforced concrete. Inside this structure live in a well-made ventilated room in well-made ventilated rooms safe from all natural enemies the entrance would be one of one or more tunnels running from the bottom of the lake our morning adventure had begun a long and busy day for carol by nightfall we were all pleasantly tired but we had come to understand anew what it meant to be busy as a beaver we had seen how they cut roadways through the forest, clearing all brush, logs, and stones so that they can drag materials to the lake shore. We saw canals that had been cut far back into the woods in which they could float their cuttings, and we had visited a stream in which they had built a dam, creating a fair-sized lake. It was in the building of this remarkable dam that the beaver showed his best energy and intelligence. The dam has a definite purpose. It streams in streams where there is a fairly constant flow of water the year round or in lakes where the water level remains somewhat the same, he seems satisfied with conditions. Here he will build his house on the bank or shore, making no effort to construct a dam. Such was the case at the beaver house that early morning. Homes in that way are generally referred to as lake beavers or bank beavers. But this creature must have water of fair depth the year round. Hence, in streams where the flow is slight or rapidly changing, he finds it best to create a pool or lake of his own, and he builds a dam. Thus, by good engineering, he can keep the water near the level that suits him best. The pool, which he creates, serves in many ways. It gives him water deep enough so that he can dive and escape from his enemy, such as the wild cat, coyote, wolf, lynx, or panther. The depth of the water <coughs> presents, <coughs> prevents the, food, the pond from freezing solid and enables, enables him to store food on the bottom. And by keeping the water level from rising, he may build his house so the floors or the rooms in which he lives will always be several inches above the surface. Beaver dams are never built twice alike, for the conditions surrounding each site chosen would be somewhat different. <clears throat> Sometimes beavers prefer remarkable engineering feats in constructing them. 
There are cases on record where they have dammed streams wherein men had previously failed. Always their construction work is strong and well suited to the place selected. The lengths of these dams vary considerably. Some are only about 20 feet long. Generally, they will measure 60 to 100 feet, while one in Yellowstone National Park has an overall length of approximately 700 feet. Tons of material were used in the construction of this remarkable dam, and a good-sized lake has been created by the backwater. But no less remarkable are their well-plastered canals. These ditches are dug deliberately to serve the beavers in their problems. They run from the beaver lake or pond back into the forest, sometimes for great distances. Generally, one to two hundred feet of length will bring the canal to the place desired, but there are records of great ones over a thousand feet long, six to nine feet wide, and having an average depth of water of nearly two feet. Through the canals, the clever little creature will swim and tow logs and branches from distant groves of trees. Here, too, they may feel greater safety from their enemies. The beaver is at, an, at an advan, is at a disadvantage on land when a wolf or wildcat approaches, but once in the water, he is well able to take care of himself. It is probably because he is so intelligent that many weird stories have been written about him. When pioneers were first pu pushing west from the Atlantic seaboard, they seemed to be in competition to see who could tell the biggest beaver stories. Of course, they were thinking much of beavers in those days. It was the seeking of beaver furs more than all else that caused people to penetrate the western wilderness. In colonial days, beaver skins were a kind of currency. Fortunes were made out of their fur. Wars were fought over preferred trapping grounds. Then it was that such stories began as that of a beaver using his tail as a trowel and building his home and dam. It was said and believed that he actually drives stakes with his tail. He has a remarkable tail, but not that remarkable. He does use it as a rudder when he is swimming. He uses it in his crash dives, as we have already seen, giving warning to the wilderness creatures. He braces himself with his tail when he is cutting a tree. He thumps the ground with it when a tree begins to fall, but there have been too many tall tales told about beaver tails. Just think, a beaver has no tools to work with except his teeth, claws, and his remarkable tail. Yet he builds a house of forest materials. He constructs a dam, perhaps hundreds of feet long. He cuts trees of considerable size, the largest on record being a cottonwood 42 inches in diameter. He digs canals, calculating the slope of land and the flow of water. His ability to work, his inherent industry fully matches his intelligence. No doubt that is because there could be no true intelligence without industry. The two are one, and laziness is a form of ignorance. The beaver is not fanatical. He does not always work, but when there is something important to be done, he puts his heart, soul, teeth, claws, yes, and his tail into it. During summertime, he shows his humanness again. He takes a vacation. He and his family may go on a trip, traveling miles and miles away from their own home. But as autumn approaches, they are back, getting ready for winter. It is then that we look upon such industry as to make us exclaim in admiration. Imagine the amount of effort, the number of trips it takes for them to cut and bring in the great volume of material used in their house and dam. Think of the scooping, dragging, biting of roots, and moving of stones necessary to prepare one of their canals, and their community appears to be a true democracy. Every beaver works, young, old, male, female, each anxiously doing his share. There is no boss, no dictator. There is no prison or penalty necessary, for each one wants to do his part. A little incident in the history of a northern lumber company shows something of the beaver's determination and his ability to work. This company was putting in a narrow-gauge railroad in the preparation for a certain logging operation. In surveying the course of the road, they came to a stream at a point where a beaver dam had created a wide pond. This presented them with something of a problem. 
Building long bridges is an expensive thing, and they wish to avoid it if possible. The men had a choice of two things. Either they could change the course of their railroad and cross the stream below the dam where a small bridge would suffice, or they could, they believed, tear out the beaver dam, let the water out of the pond, and bridge the stream thus narrowed where they were. They chose the latter course, unfortunately for them. In accordance with this plan, one day they tore out a large section of the beaver dam and went away to give the pond a chance to drain. They calculated that by the next day the water would be so low that they could begin work on their bridge. But then when they returned the next morning, they found that the beavers had fully repaired the dam during the night. There it stood, stronger than ever, reinforced with new material and the water of the pond just as it had been. Determined, the men tore the dam out again, making a much greater break than before. That would show these little flat tails who was boss. But again, during the night, the beavers did a wonderful repair job, and the dam was in perfect condition by the next morning. This time, the men became rather violent. They blew up the dam with dynamite. The beavers built it up again. The men tore it out again, however, and believing a far-spread story that beavers are afraid of a light, they drove a stake in the center of the newly made break and hung a lantern on it. They returned in the morning, confident that this time they had outwitted their four-footed competitors. But what a sight met their eyes. There was the dam, fully rebuilt, higher and wider, and the lantern, still burning, sat on top of it. The flat tails, far from being afraid of the light, had built their new dam right up underneath the lantern so high that the bottom of the lantern actually rested on it. After that, the lumbermen changed the route of their logging road and crossed the stream at another place. This happened in the early logging days. But even now, one may see the bend in that railroad right-of-way where men had to alter their plans because of the undefeatable industry of beavers. While beavers are social, while beavers are sociable among their kind and generally live in colonies or communities, it happens occasionally that one will draw away from beavers by himself, even as a human hermit. There are many guesses why they do this. One thought is that such solitary creatures have lost their mates and prefer to live alone. Another is that they are lazy ones or perhaps outlaws and are driven away by their fellows. No one knows the true explanation, but we cannot read the thoughts, for we cannot read the thoughts of beavers. There is the story of one of these solitary old beavers living alone in the black in a blackwoods pool in a backwoods pool who took a dislike to trout fishermen. There were trout in his pond, and he did not want these fish disturbed. He simply abhorred fishermen. Other people could come to his home without fishing equipment, and he would pay no attention to them. But let someone start casting a fly around, and the old fellow would swim wildly about the surface, beating the water with his tail and frightening the wily trout. While the beaver lived, no trout were caught in that pond. It wasn't that the beaver wanted the fish for himself. Beavers did not eat fish or any other kind of meat. But apparently he liked the companionship of fish, and he had his own way of protecting them. As the day was closing, Carol and Jenny and I stood upon a beaver dam in the forest creek back of the sanctuary. Before us lay a little lake created by the backwaters. Dead trees and bushes stood in the water in great numbers, and in the deepest part of the pond was the beaver house. Tiny streams of water were finding their way over the top of the dam, making little musical waterfalls whose songs fit well with the wilderness. Years ago, I had watched this dam built. The creek was rather a tiny one, not more than ten feet wide. However, the beavers had found it to their liking. There was a constant flow of water, and the banks of the stream were lined with fine groves of aspen. The little engineers set to work, and it was, almost, and it was most interesting to watch them. First, they felled a number of trees and cut them up in sections to get material ready. Then they took small live branches and began forcing them into the sand at the bottom of the creek at a chosen point. 
I did not understand the purpose of this at first, but soon it was clear what they were doing. They continued placing these branches at this point until till there was a row of them from bank to bank directly across the current. It made sort of a picket fence through which the creek waters were filtering. It was now that the beavers revealed their plan. Upstream from this little, this newly made fence, there were several places in the creek where there, ha- there were deep holes. In these through the years, had been accumulated a deposit of decayed leaves, grass, and mud on the bottom. The wise little animals deliberately dived and stirred up this deposit, scratching it and digging it loose until the creek was filled with floating material. As the debris drifted down, it it came against the fence they had prepared and was caught there. The little fellows kept stirring up more and more of it in the stream above and sending it drifting down. Finally, enough of it had been caught fence for the flow of the stream to be held back, and the first step of the building of their dam had been successfully completed. Now they brought in the newly cut logs and placed them in the proper position. Then layers and layers of mud and leaves were added until a dam, twenty feet long and three feet high, had been made. This had created a pond large and deep enough for their winter needs. Year after year the dam was enlarged until it was over three hundred feet in length. It is wonderful, declared Carol, as the significance of her day's experience was dawning upon her. But isn't this a great waste? I mean, in the trees they cut and destroy? Yes, Carol, there is some waste from our human viewpoint. Throughout the ages, beavers have been in the forest doing as they do today, and in general, they are beneficial to the woods. But where we human beings enter the picture, some of their work is damaging. There are instances where beavers have cut down a farmer's fruit trees and where their ponds have flooded valuable tracts of timberland. Cases, they must be removed. Yet, they are friendly to the forest. Their ponds hold back the water deposited by spring rains and prevent it from brushing down streams, causing floods and carrying away fertile soil. In dry seasons, winds Blowing across these ponds carry moisture out to the nearby plants and trees. Ducks and other water birds find their ponds fine nesting places. In many cases, beaver pools are a great benefit to fish life, and they are effective in combating forest fires. But their greatest contribution to the growth of the forest comes over a long period of years. As hundreds and hundreds of their pools accumulate, decaying Leaves, logs, grasses, lily pads, mud, and fertile soil for the future. In our Midwestern states, many millions of acres of our finest forest and farmland have been created by prehistoric beaver ponds. Thus, they have been serving us for ages. It is one of nature's most effective ways of building up soil, and today, Ponds of our northern forests are doing this work, making lands where the finest trees of the future will grow. When evening had come, we guided our canoe into Beaver Bay once more to see if our little furred friends had continued their labors. Moonlight was strong and the landscape lighted with a soft glow. Small birch trees at the shoreline looked like fairy fingers pointing to the sky. Pine trees made grotesque clown-like figures with their silhouettes. Now we heard the familiar gnawing sound as a beaver chewed patiently at a tree. Do you know what he is saying? asked Carol in a whisper. We awaited her answer for her to her own question. He is says he is saying work 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 and her impersonation of the sound was so fitting jenny and i whispered good we sat for some time staring into the shore whence came the sound our canoe drifting among the lily pads that reflected the moon suddenly carol drew our attention in another direction with a silent wave of her arm she pointed on down the shoreline We looked, and the sight we saw drew a whisper of wonder and admiration. There at the water's edge stood an enormous deer, still as a statue, studying the night. 
He looked more like some great graceful spirit than a flesh and blood animal. I risked a whispered comment. Jenny and Carol, that is the antlered king. He is the largest buck in all these forests. It was hardly necessary to speak of his size. Other deer we were seeing regularly would have been dwarfed beside him. Probably he weighed nearly 400 pounds. This was the great creature who had left his tracks along the sands and the trails. It was he whom we were anxious to see and whom we seldom looked upon. He bent his great antlered head to the waters and bit off a lily pad. Then he raised up again and stood looking around alertly as he chewed his delectable bite. As yet, he had not noticed us. No doubt we were hidden in the shoreline shadows cast by the moon. Then the grand old creature, a monarch among his people, no doubt, began walking slowly in the shallow waters. With each step he raised his leg high as if on parade. We scarcely breathed, so thrilled were we by his wilderness picture. But suddenly, close to our canoe, there was a sharp sound like a muffled gunshot. Had discovered us and executed his sound of alarm by slapping the water with his tail and diving. We might have been more startled had it not been for the magnificent action of the antlered king. He bolted upright on his hind feet, his front feet pawing the air in the manner of a spirited horse, his great head bent far back. Still on his hind legs, he turned majestically toward land and executed a graceful leap into the sh shoreline shadows. By the sound of breaking brush, we could trace his flight through the black forest. Then the wild would settle back to silence again, except for the occasional splash of the beaver now far out in the lake. Good, ejaculated want of something better to say. We were all so completely under the spell of our adventure that any comment seemed inadequate. We just sat looking at the place in the curtain of the night where the antler king had disappeared. Finally, Jinny made a suggestion of which we all approved. Let's not talk about this now. Just keep the picture in our thoughts, she said in a half whisper. Suppose we go home and to bed in silence. This adventure will be ready for con conversation in the morning. It is too precious for words right now. Work, 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 began anew the song of the beaver as we paddled to the cabin. And that is the end of chapter number 12. Tomorrow, Aunt Nikki will bring to you chapter number 13, and we'll see you then. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.